Monday always brings with it a special set of issues and discourses. This beginning of a new week leaves us wondering why Lindsey Graham believes he can cut through all the static that is at the moment the Republican presidential chase. If the president perhaps believes local police departments should start using harsh language when the crooks always seem to come to the party better armed than law enforcement. And noting how Al Sharpton's daughter is suing the city of New York for $5 million, claiming a city street caused her sprained ankle, then Instagram posting her climb of a mountain in Bali. Always a pleasure to see that rotten apples never fall far from the fraudulent trees. Another week, another search for real answers without all the fluff. I'm Ed Berliner, and this is The Hard Line. We're sending a message to Shell that the people who live here don't want their rig based here. We don't want them to be going and drilling in the Arctic. We want to start the transition to a sustainable energy economy, which is not based on fossil fuels. And we're putting together the plans to be able to know exactly how we're going to deal with Syria. In the end, there's nothing to negotiate. There's no way to deal with these people except eliminate them from the field of battle, and that is exactly what we are going to do over time. There were at least 50 weapons recovered that were not police weapons. These were bad guy weapons. They ranged from brass knucks to knives to chains to clubs and to firearms. This was a true gang fight that occurred at this location. We've seen how militarized gear can sometimes give people a feeling like there's an occupying force as opposed to a force that's part of the community that's protecting them and serving them. One hundred and ninety-two individuals are being booked and processed into the McLennan County Jail. Those are individuals that were involved in the Twin Peaks shooting last night. They are all being charged with engaging in organized crime. Our McLennan County District Attorney has been on scene all night and assisting us with this investigation as has helped us secure arrest for all of those 192 individuals. A scuffle in a restroom quickly turns into an all out war between rival biker gangs at a restaurant in Texas. Nine people are killed. And with nearly 200 bikers on scene, it's amazing that no civilians or police officers were injured. And now the question will be raised about President Obama's policies that limit the types of armaments police departments have at their disposal to deal with incidents such as these, when a lot of times they are outmanned and simply outgunned. Our first guest is a constitutional attorney and author of the book Battlefield America, The War on the American People, John Whitehead. Joined by former Atlanta police officer, now also attorney and author of Observations of White Noise, an acid test for the First Amendment, Mark Harold. Gentlemen, I thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Mark, as a former cop, I'm going to start with you. The president wants to limit the military-style equipment for police forces, yet we see, as we saw in Texas at so many times, those crooks, the criminals, they come armed even better than the cops himself. Is this a good or a bad idea? Well, I, you know, I think there's a couple of facets to this. The first thing is the, the original step with certain things like bayonets and grenade launchers and certain things, that's not going to make a great deal of difference. It's going to be the later steps, the streamlining process that they're putting into place as to how you have to justify the need for this. Uh, the biggest problem I see with this is it's sort of a reverse carrot and stick, but the federal government is way too involved with state and local policing. And now by uh, sort of ironically pulling their equipment donations or, or redistribution out, they're going to take a more proactive approach in how state and local police uh, departments operate. Uh, so in a way, this is strange. It seems like the federal government's getting out of state and local policing, but with this report and all of the, the strings they're going to attach, they're finding new ways to infiltrate state and local policing. John, would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. I think the uh, most of the police departments I deal with, and I help write constitutional courses for some police departments, uh, they're heavily involved in the Department of Homeland Security, FBI. So many of them have already been federalized. But uh, limiting uh, some of the weapons, you know, as I show in my book, Battlefield America, when you uh, put camouflage outfits on, black garbed outfits, all the weapons, it changes the mentality of the psychology of policemen. Often they act differently when they see an American citizen. Uh, if you go back uh, just 20 or 30 years ago, you didn't see any of that. We didn't see all the un unarmed shootings and all the things we're seeing today. So I think this uh, Obama's, it's a step in the right direction. 
Uh, but, you know, it's, it's not going to cure the problem unless they cure, and I'd like to hear the uh, other guests, uh, unless you cure the, the training of the police, how, they, how they're how they trained in the academies. Well, I, I, I think we're getting to a point right academy. there, too, as well, John, and, and I want to get to Mark on this, and that is training at the police academies. Absolutely, we need better training, but it still comes down to being armed, I think, many times, Mark, because a lot of the cops I talk to, they say, look, we don't need a lot of the, the, the heavy armament, but the guys coming at us many times, we don't know if we're going into a convenience store and a guy is loaded for bear and outguns us. That's a little scary. Well, I think that's true. Look, I, you know, there's always going to be a, a part for SWAT, for special units, for specialized units, and that, that's fine. And I think it gets a little blurry when you talk about the militarization, the approach of police officers in, in situations, everyday situations, and seeing that as somehow having to limit SWAT. I think we need to get away from the more military look of police the vests on the outside, sort of the ninja turtle look that you see where they, they're just armed to bear for their more routine duties. Now, in no way would I say that the specialized units of the SWAT teams don't need access to this equipment, but we've blurred the lines, and I think a lot of this has to do with the drug war. Uh, you don't see the cop on patrol. You don't view him the same way when he's, you know, got the, the, the flak jacket, he's got the vest on the outside. It's, I agree with the other guests. I agree with John, who have followed his work for years. It's a, it's a mentality, and it's how approachable police officers are. So it's never a question of whether police officers in certain situations are going to need to resort to that the warrior mentality, the responsive, you know, arm to the teeth. They need access to those weapons, but that needs to not be the, the that needs to be the exception and not the rule. The everyday police officer needs to be more of a peacekeeper and to look to work with the community. So it all has to do with context and and how we see our our, our police officers in their different roles. John, let me ask you then, would context though really work? Because we see what happens in a lot of cities. We also saw what happened in Baltimore and Ferguson, where there were people who were simply out there to create mayhem. They were out there to hurt. They were out there to loot, if you will. But if you have a cop who's just dressed in a standard uniform, doesn't have all the SWAT gear on, isn't loaded to the teeth, doesn't have the gun across the chest, will that really stop them from wanting to be part of a crime? Hey, I think good policing. By the way, if you study Baltimore, in five years before Baltimore, 70% uh, of the people shot in Baltimore were black people, 40% unarmed. Uh, halfway through that process, if you do the kind of policing you need to do, and good policing like our other guests are talking about, you'd have seen that would have been a problem. It's like Morgan Freeman said, it took riots for people to figure out that something's wrong with the policing we're doing today. I've worked with cops across the board who are concerned about the militarized police. They're saying, hey, let's just go back to being the local guy on the block. Let's go up and shake hands with a citizen. Let's don't shoot a guy running away, a, a, an, armed, an unarmed citizen, in the back four times. We just don't do that. So if you change the mentality of the police and the training, you're going to get a different product. Uh, I agree that this is a step in the right direction. But, you know, in December, just six months ago, Obama was defending the program. Mm -hmm. So it took all the more for him to make a decision like this, that we need to do a better job of pulling the equipment back. But training is going to be one big problem, uh, one big issue here. And if we don't do that, I, I, I think the problem is going to continue. I got a little over a minute, Mark. I'm going to go back to you here and talk about the mentality of the cops themselves and the training that we talked about. Is it not fair to say, though, that the mentality of the individuals in the streets need to change as well? Because if the cops are changing and becoming more accessible and more friendly, if you will, then the people on the streets have got to realize that they cannot take the sort of actions they take. They got to pull back a little bit. Yes. Well, absolutely, and that's hopefully what this would lead to. Look, going back to what we were talking about with the with the riots, once a riot breaks out, once there is a situation where police need, in other words, I have no absolutely no problem, no matter if you're de-emphasizing this sort of military look for the police officer on the beat. Look, once the riot breaks out, I have no problem with those officers then being issued or returning to the precinct, whatever they need to do. So we're all agreed then that what we really need, though, you need those SWAT teams, though. They still have absolutely. to be fully armed to the teeth. Well, SWAT needs to be specialized, needs to be special. It's not the norm. It's something that you use in reaction to certain situations. I have no problem. Once the riot breaks out, I have no problem with what I would consider patrol officers getting access to different equipment because of the situation, grabbing the gas mask, getting the batons, mm -hmm. getting the shield. But it's situational. And I think it, the mentality shift will lead, will, will reap dividends across the communities over time. Okay, 15 seconds, John. I see you nodding your head. You agree with that? People, I talk to local policemen who do a good job. They walk up and shake hands with people. They deal with their community. They sit down and talk with people. They have community meetings. They have virtually no violence in their communities. It's how you treat people. We need to learn that. If our government officials treat people differently, I think you're going to get a different reaction. So, I mean, it's just if you shake hands with somebody or you raise a fist, what, what kind of reaction are you going to get? We can hope you're correct. John Whitehead, Battlefield America, The War on the American People, and Mark Harold.
observations of white noise and acid tests for the First Amendment. Always a pleasure, gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with us. The fastest 60 minutes of news continues.